Hello to you, I do hope you're well and a very warm welcome to this A-level English language revision session. I'm Bo Model, and today we're taking a look at occupation. So how does your job or your job role influence the language that you use? And I wanted to start off today by just taking a look at some of the key theories you could talk about in a question on occupation. So we could talk about Drew and Heritage and their concept of institutional talk. Remember that involves goal orientation, so the fact that your job will involve you working with people towards a common aim and objective. Uh, turn taking, so for example the doctor and patient or the boss and the employee. Allowable contributions, what you're allowed to say in certain contexts within the uh, workplace, uh, say in a meeting for example, the use of professional lexis, so jargon, which of course is very controversial, should it be used or not, what do we think, um, the use of structure, so the agenda of a meeting or the format of an interview for example, uh, lexical asymmetry, for example the boss and the employee, the language they can use, how it should reflect, mirror and respond to the language used by others in the workplace. So, key bit there on institutional talk from Drew and Heritage. We've also got interpersonal markers, that's from Coyster, and the fact that when we're in business conversations, we're not really taking into account the personal needs of the other person. And so it's not like phatic talk, small talk, where we are talking about them. So instead, we need to compensate through our use of those interpersonal markers. So we've got that need to show the relational goals, so the people goals, in our transactional talk. So the use of modals, can and will, of vague language, things like or something, of idioms, can I have a word with you? It's not needed when we're engaging in office gossip or talk, you know, oh, nice weather today, but it is important when in a, a business conversation because we need to recognize we're talking to human beings not robots and so to negotiate to connect with them to get the best out of those conversations we need to also take into account those interpersonal needs and so we do that through the use of interpersonal markers uh, john swales talks about discourse communities this is quite similar to the idea of drew and heritage the idea of those shared goals and purposes, again, you know, say, what is Tesco? What are all their employees trying to do? What is the business's aims and objectives? Or if you've got a new startup company, you know, what are the goals that you're all working towards? And how does that shape and influence the language you use? Uh, the broadly agreed set of common goals, the mechanisms that are in place for communication, the ability to communicate is so important. So there's things like emails, but a hierarchy of a, a structure for the company to know who to talk to about what and when. Uh, the mechanisms for information and feedback. For this, I always think of like a school and marking. You do your work and then there's a, a system in place for the teacher to respond. So in a workplace, you've got the IRF model, the initiation response feedback model, the steps and stages included in um, getting feedback on things, on how that conversation and discussion will take place. And then obviously a threshold level for expertise within a discourse community. You've got to say, teachers, you've got a degree in your subject. You are a specialist in that area or a doctor. Again, you know what you're talking about. There's something that's needed to say, yes, you can join this discourse community. And within an occupation, it's quite straightforward that you have got the uh, qualifications, for example, to do that role. You've had the relevant training. And so that gives you a common level of understanding. You've actually got a shared understanding and knowledge of what's being discussed. Uh, and then face theory. This is the idea that we have a, a positive face, which is all about wanting to feel approved and valued and that we are getting the praise we deserve. And so an employer needs to make sure they're appealing to the positive face of the employee. You know, that was great work. Well done. Oh, that could just uh, that could just be amazing. Really boosting their self-esteem. And then the negative face, which is all about face threatening acts, where if we feel imposed upon, you know, do this put that there, that we won't be motivated. And in terms of motivation, and in terms of using language in a positive way in the workplace, 
it's so important for employees to try not to um, violate either the positive faith or the negative faith. So, for example, going, would you mind? You know, it would really help. It would be a good favour. Using that kind of tentative language of um, modality, you know, would you, could you, to sort of encourage and to make sure the negative faith, not feeling imposed upon, is um, safeguarded through the apologetic language. Um, and then accommodation theory, of course. Howard Child, our man, talking about convergence, using language to come together with the person you're talking to. So upward or downward convergence, making yourself sound as intelligent as them or dumbing down to seem down with the kids. And then on the other side of it, divergence, emphasising the differences. So if you're a boss, for example, you might want to assert your authority and show that you are the big chief. You are the CEO, and so you are going to use language that creates that prestige and that authority and power to demonstrate to people and to make sure your authority is recognised. So those two key concepts there. So there's some of the theorists. I wanted us to first of all look at the question. Evaluate. Remember, we're always evaluating, so you've got that higher level of critique coming in, evaluate the view that a person's occupation completely determines the language they speak. So how would we say, yes, it does? So there's clear evidence that the language you use is shaped by your job because it helps to be productive in the workplace. Drew and heritage, institutional talk, the ideas of goal orientation, of turn-taking rules, professional access to jargon, allowable contributions, it all serves a specific purpose. It benefits the business. It helps the employee and the employers to work towards their, um, their goals. Let's be honest, it's not just a chit chat. There are aims and objectives in businesses. There is money to be made. There are targets to meet. And so it's right that the language used really reflects that and focuses everybody involved in the business on working towards those goals to achieving those objectives and bringing about that positive progress and change. So we could then say it's like our little critique bit, yes, so it makes sense. Drew and Heritage are right. Use a few examples of that goal-orientated conversation. Use a case study, you know, a boss and an employee. Uh, we could say it's right that this is within the occupational context, but then say, however, outside of work, we could say it may not have an impact on them. So we could then also say, we could say outside of work, code switching, when you're moving from that public discourse to being private, at home, chatting to your family and friends, it doesn't really matter anymore. You know, why would you need to continue speaking in the way you spoke at work when you're at home relaxing? So we could say it's about the context and the code switching going on, that actually it's only influential on your speech when engaged in workplace conversations. So you could say, no, it doesn't, because we are more concerned with how other people are speaking than how we ourselves are. And this is really important for job roles where you're working with non-subject specialists. So, for example, a doctor cannot sit down with a patient and go, so your fMRI results are suggesting to me that the, um, you know, your cerebral cortex, there's a corpus callosum issue, Broca's area, giving them all these lexical jargon that are knowledgeable and known about to a doctor but to a non-subject specialist is very confusing and it would be detrimental to the, the success of the conversation. So actually it's about who you're speaking to. This is where we can bring in Howard Giles a convergence divergence. So if you've got a patient you might converge, downwardly converge your language to them to say, you know, oh well, you know, we need to give you a brain scan and then do an operation that would do this, this and this. Explain it in simple terms to them so they can understand it. Um, but then obviously when you are speaking with colleagues, again, you'd converge to them, you might upwardly converge your language to make a good impression, to sound like them, to fit in. So we could say that it is all about accommodating to others. So it's not about your job role, it's part of your job role, it's important as part of your job, but it's about the other people. So teachers, they need to make their language accessible and understandable to their students in order for it to be a success. 
So it's all about your um, use of language to facilitate the needs of others. We could say, yes, your occupation does determine your language because the discourse community is central to workplace communications. So John Swales, the idea of discourse community with that specific lexis, the mechanisms for communication, the mechanisms for feedback and responses, the use of language to communicate. So you could use retail, for example, so they'll talk about RRPs, loss leaders, about your turnover. It makes sense and it helps to give efficient conversation to bring about successful dialogue and communication within the business context. And so we can say, yes, because your occupation requires the accurate use of language in an efficient and effective way, then it will determine the language you use because you are part of a discourse community which shapes the language you use. Link that in maybe to uh, Wave and Wenger and their communities of practice, that there is a shared practice that you're engaged in. You're all working for the same company, so you're using their jargon and their language. Link in jargon there. Colleen Galeni, it's used as a tool for sharing meaning effectively within businesses. So it is essential to the success of you in the company that your language is reflecting that of the business. But then we could say, no, uh, your occupation doesn't completely determine your language because it depends on the social situation. So, for example, code switching. Uh, when you are in a meeting, it does, but then when you're on your break at lunchtime, no. Gossip, chat, chit-chat, all that jazz is very different. So it's only when it's necessary, only when in a formal environment, you could say. And we could bring in here cloisters into personal markets and the idea that we uh, need to make up for our lack of social and transactional talk when in meetings, for example. And so there is going to be a difference. We make a conscious effort in our occupational talk to make up for those interpersonal markers, to bring in that interpersonal relationship and those connections. Whereas when we're just talking casually, we don't need to do that. So it shows that there is a difference and that our occupation does determine the language we use because it's for very clear business aims or you know, for a doctor for medical aims or whatever. Whereas when we're in our mundane, small talk, phatic talk, we don't need to do that. So you could say it does depend on the situation, but at the same time, your occupation does shape the language you use because it is essential for your success as an employee, as an employer, to use the language of the discourse community, to be engaged in the institutional talk, to be using the jargon and communicating in that clear way. So I wanted to now just take a look at another element of occupation that could come up, and it could even be like an article. And in the essay format, it might say, evaluate the idea that occupational language hinders rather than aids expression. And when you hear that, you should be thinking instantly, jargon, 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 the use of jargon in business. And it's a bit of a head to head, if you like, between Colleen Galeni on one side and Jenny Chapman on the other. And they go head to head and they're saying, jargon, you've got Colleen saying, great, use it, it's gonna boost your business. And then on the other side, you've got Jenny Chapman, bless her soul, saying no. It's hindering understanding, it's holding you back. Let's be honest, it's not helping us in our occupations. We need to ban it and then our business will be better. So we could say it does hinder rather than aid expression because it's pointless. So Jenny Chapman, she says it is a pointless and unnecessary irritation. She says things like thinking outside the box are pointless. She did a study. 64% of people agreed that thinking outside the box um, is pointless and it's an irritation. She says it's actually a substitute for thinking about goals and that's the important bit. It actually hinders, okay? It hinders expression because it stops us from actually thinking and getting to those business conversations and sorting the things out. Instead, we're too caught up with, oh, blue sky thinking thinking outside the box, coming up with these catchphrases that have no meaning. So we could then say, as like our little critique of this, 
We'd say it's obvious that these cliches and metaphors are annoying, they're pointless irritation, Jeff, but they are so widespread in their usage that people do actually understand them and so they can serve a purpose in terms of motivation and in terms of using language that people are familiar with in the business. So we could then say, so no, jargon is not something that hinders, it does actually aid. We could say it plays a role in enhancing talks and in improving communication. Bring in Colleen, of course. She says it enhances our understanding. It brings people within a business together. Remember, institutional talk, a discourse community, a common goal, a common aim, a common cause that they're all united under. And so jargon gives them that sense of identity, that collective community. It has a role to play in the workplace, in motivating them, in giving them breakthroughs and insights into the use of language. However, we could uh, say that it's only in some situations that it can help. Yes, Colleen, go on, you're quite right. But it can actually end up hindering if overused. So your critique there could be like, yes, she's correct. It helps enhance talks, improve communication, but only to a point. It begins to hinder understanding when it becomes overused. That is when it becomes a pointless, unnecessary irritation. Make sure you do a bit of Googling for examples of jargon you could drop in to an essay or an article. Um, and we could go further to say for a new employee it could be quite exclusive. So Milroy, open and close networks. If you're a new employee going into this very close network uh, where they're speaking in this jargon and you're like what's going on, it's going to be very hard for you to understand. So you need to pick it up very quickly to get integrated into the business. And so we could say for new employees, it can present a challenge to their understanding of what's going on, what's expected of them, because people are bombarding them with these jargonic terms. Is that even a word? Jargonic? There's your neologism for today. Um, these terms being bombarded at them they don't understand and they're thinking what on earth have I signed up for so we could say that a uh, jargon uh, or occupational language sorry helps because it helps to achieve goals so I mentioned a little bit earlier we could say Drew and Heritage institutional talk you know uh, and the specific Lexis that you share it is right that we speak in a certain way because it facilitates the uh, achieving of certain goals so say for doctors, they're using these technical terms, this jargon, this occupational language because it's relevant to their discussions, because it's helping them to make new scientific breakthroughs, to make diagnoses, to ensure that they are working together and they are helping people and improving lives. But you could then say, well, yes, OK, so it does help achieve goals, but only when people have a common understanding. And so we could link in here that it is not helpful, and this could be our next point, when working with people who are not specialists. So we could say occupational language hinders rather than aids expression if you are communicating with a non-subject specialist, if you are in a role where you're working with the public. So when you're speaking, you know, you've got like the plain English campaign, you're speaking to the public, to clients, to customers, to patients, that if we don't converge with them, if we don't make our language accessible and understandable to them, so we're there using our little occupational language, talking in our little um, jargon terms, can I call them that? Uh, we're speaking in that language, using our special lexis, all in this little bubble, that when we actually come to facing the public and to working with a mainstream market, a mainstream audience, we actually do cause confusion. And that could really upset a patient, cause trouble for a doctor. So we could say, so doctors can use it with colleagues in their meetings, when they're doing an operation, etc. But when it's with a different audience, when they're with a patient in the GP surgery, or speaking to a patient after the operation, they need to be careful because it can hinder the patient's understanding and that can have implications. Oh, so there we go. That's a little look at occupational language. I do hope you've enjoyed it. Remember Brown, remember Levinson, remember Howard Giles, 
Keep Jenny Chapman in mind at all times, of course. Do in heritage, John Swales. Thank you very much for your company. I've been Ben Wardle. You can follow me on Instagram, Ben Wardle underscore, on Twitter at Ben Wardle UK. Like, comment, and do subscribe, of course, and I'll see you next time. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye for now.